Hello, and welcome to the final poster session, the final event of our three-day Fulbright Association Conference, which has abundantly shown that curiosity, caring, a commitment to genuine mutual understanding between our fellow human beings and civic duty are all alive and well in the Fulbright community. May we share our stories today, all of which will be recorded far and wide and build momentum for the better world we believe in and work for every day of our lives. It's my pleasure to introduce the final poster session, Activism and Change. My name is Alison Gardy. I'm a board member of the Fulbright Association and a Fulbright grantee to Mexico. We have five presentations this afternoon, including one that has three co-presenters, 10 minutes for each presentation. And at the end, we'll have 25 minutes for questions and answers. You can chat in the chat box. For questions, however, please put them in the Q&A. First, I really would like to applaud Rob Lively Jr., who chairs the program committee, consisting of Eniko Ksome, Ann Lewis, Jay Nathan, Trey Quinn, and Rob himself. The committee received 137 proposals and made the recommendations for inclusion in the program. Rob, we thank you for your leadership and program committee members, we thank you for your commitment. And now to introduce the activism and change panelists. Carla Cabrera Cuadrado will be talking about embracing changes in a changing world and how the pandemic affected her Fulbright experience. And Carla is a Spanish Fulbright scholar, recently graduated from American University School of International Service, where she, create, where she completed her MA in intercultural and inter international communication with a concentration on cultural and public diplomacy. And um, she has other degrees as well and is an intercultural communication specialist and um, is on the board of directors of the Society of Intercultural Education, Training and Research. Um, she's been around the world. She welcomes you to connect with her on LinkedIn. And Carla, without further ado, please take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction, Alison. I'll try to share my screen right now for my presentation. So let me know when you can see it. Um, one second since I lost connection, but no problem, should be up in a minute. Uh, there it is. Good. So today in my presentation, I wanna talk about how to embrace all these changes that are happening right now with the coronavirus and they're definitely inevitable and how these changes actually affected my Fulbright experience. So as Alison said, um, Carla, I'm a, a Spanish Fulbrighter and I came to, I went to Washington DC to study my master's in intercultural international communication and uh, my Fulbright experience was really different than what I thought when the COVID-19 arrived in 2020. So before coronavirus, I had a lot of plans for my last month at Fulbright. Um, I was gonna celebrate an international affair at the Uzbek embassy because I was the president of the Grado Student Council and it was like the final big event. I was also really looking forward to graduate as a real American with the cap and gown that I had seen in so many American movies. I also wanted to find a job in Washington DC especially in public and cultural diplomacy because it's the hub for the field and it's, it's not very easy to work in those kind of organizations in other parts of the world for my OPT. And of course, during that year of um, training, I would have liked to travel more around the US and get to know the places that I didn't go to. 
But of course, everything changed with the coronavirus. No gatherings of more than 50 people were allowed. We were not able to do any university event. I was not able to say bye to a lot of friends that I met there. Of course, we didn't have a commencement ceremony. It was impossible to find a job because all the companies were crazy about coronavirus. All of them were answering. We stopped the selection process. We know what's gonna happen. We're not hiring anymore. We're actually firing people. So this was this, uh, it was this crazy moment of what to do. And of course, it was not possible to travel around the US anymore. So I couldn't spend my last months doing that either. But um, I had to embrace those changes and look at the positive way of finishing my Fulbright experience in DC. So one of the things that I really loved and I'm sure that I wouldn't have done if it wasn't for coronavirus was our own commencement ceremony at home with my roommates and the cap and gown and our photo session and a very lovely family, family speech and stuff like that. Um, it was nice to have a different and for my Fulbright experience much more closer to my friends and my roommates and people that were um, had been really close to me during the experience. But I was wondering all the time, what do I do with my life now? I had all these plans of finding a job, staying in DC for one more year. I was very convinced I was going to get that. So I had to completely change the mindset and think, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to go back to Spain because my visa was uh, expiring. What am I gonna do? Am I gonna look for a job there? I thought of joining the foreign service. I also thought of applying for European Union jobs and everything was very confusing. I didn't know where to go, but it was good that the coronavirus brought us one thing, one good thing, which was more virtual communication. So, while being in Spain, I was able to keep talking with my colleagues in DC and having meetings and organizing ourselves for new projects, which I'm sure we wouldn't have done if, um, if online meetings weren't that common right now. And with that, I saw myself starting a nonprofit organization that um, I had never thought of before this happened. So this organization is Small Perspectives, and we created it to offer first-time writers and young professionals the foundational skills of open writing in order to get their new and innovative perspectives into the policy discussions by publishing in important media outlets. So during this last month, um, We've been working on shaping the mission of the organization, shaping the structure, looking for an advisory board, looking for an editorial team. And it's been a very fulfilling experience. And I'm happy that Fulbright brought me to this position because of the people I met, thanks to Fulbright, but also because of the easiness of having all these virtual conversations and create an organization being in three completely different parts of the world. So um, this was one of the best things that my Fulbright experience and the coronavirus brought me. We're still working on it, but as you can see in the picture, we're already doing workshops for open writing and we're definitely welcoming any uh, volunteers for editorial team, but also for communications. and. We are still working on doing the full launch to have more uh, information on our website and everything, but this is just like a little bit of information of our organization. And another big update in my life that came from the COVID-19 and my full experience was my interest for public diplomacy and my question of what do I do with my life now that led me to apply for a PhD that I never thought of. And I can say now that two days ago I was admitted to the program. So 
this January, I'll be starting a PhD in communication interculturality, exactly the master's that I studied with Fulbright. And it is going to be on public diplomacy of Spain in the United States, which was my master thesis and a topic that I made a lot of research in DC during my Fulbright experience and that I keep doing um, because I love it. And I hope that this will lead me to a um, job someday and maybe to another Fulbright scholarship if I keep doing research with them. So that conclusion of the presentation is that looking at changes with a positive mindset is the most important thing because a lot of changes at sometimes open doors that we haven't seen before. And I can totally say that one year I didn't see myself here at all. I didn't see myself opening an organization. I didn't see myself doing a PhD. And I honestly think that it has been a really good decision. And it's all thanks to how the situation developed, even if it was good or bad, but I tried to look at it with a positive mindset and embracing the changes that have been happening in the world. So thank you very much for this presentation. In other situations, maybe that would have been me at the Fulbright conference um, given this presentation, but we have to embrace changes and this virtual world is the current world. So thank you very much. If you wanna connect with me, as Allison said, you can add me on LinkedIn or you can email me and I'll be happy to talk more about the organization, the PhD or um, anything you will like. Thank you very much. Carla, thank you so much. And uh, also for keeping time. <laughs> uh, again, we'll have a chance to ask Carla questions and the other speakers questions um, in the last 25 minutes of our panel. Next, um, I'd love to introduce and please correct me, be Truly, if I mispronounce your name, but is it Arati Kohli? It's um, Arthi, but the spelling is misleading. Arthi. Arthi. Uh, well, only misleading if you don't know the pattern, right? Now, I, <laughs> now I'm, you're educating me. Arti Kohli, thank you, who will be talking about Echo Villages, a sustainable lifestyle for the future, question mark. And Arti, is a New Yorker through and through and is also Deputy Director of Strategic Planning and Executive Affairs at NYC Census 2020, an initiative lost, uh, launched by the city to ensure that every New Yorker, especially those in historically underrepresented communities are fully counted and represented in the 2020 Census. Um, and RT is also a 2017-2018 Fulbright Scholar. As part of her grant to India, she conducted over 150 one-on-one -on -one interviews which evaluated the benefits and challenges of Echo Village living from the perspective of community members. And um, currently, she also chairs the program, co-chairs the program committee on the Associate Board of Generation Citizen, a nonprofit organization dedicated to civics education. Arti, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, Allison. And it was definitely a fun experience to look back on my research since it's been a few years and um, it's made me want to go back to India. And that's something I really miss about the new world we're living in, but I was living through my photos. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so um, I titled it initially when I started this research as a sustainable lifestyle for the future and quickly realized through the model I was utilizing that it wasn't realistic to determine whether or not this model um, as a whole was successful, but through case study analysis and um, understanding from the perspective of community members and conversations, I could understand from the perspective of these two eco villages, the benefits and challenges of living in this type of a community. So the motivations for doing this research, 
I'm Indian of origin. Um, both my parents were born in India. Um, being Indian is something that's really important to me and is a huge aspect of my identity. And every time when I would go to India, it was very clear that there were some environmental issues that definitely impacted the lifestyle. And this piece was actually published um, recently, and it really shows how air pollution and air quality, something I experienced firsthand living in Delhi, um, is a huge problem and is exact will exacerbate um, COVID-19 um, for folks who live there. So I really think it's important you know, to think as a whole, but also specifically in India, the context of India, what are certain things we can do to really make the community more sustainable? So what are eco-villages? Um, this is a question I got many times while doing this research. Um, and there are many different definitions, but I really liked this definition that um, one of the eco-villages I was working with, an environmental body, Sigma 6Q, came up with, which is living models of sustainability. Um, usually the inhabitants are environmentally conscious. Sometimes they have a spiritual emphasis. Um, they're several different types of eco-villages. They're urban, they're rural, they're intentional or traditional. Um, and there's actually an eco-village network called the Global Eco-Village Network, um, which has recorded and has a map on their website where they map over 400 different eco-villages across the world. But that being said, there are probably many different eco-villages that exist that are not formally documented. So why do eco-villages exist? There are many different reasons, but some of the reasons I wanted to highlight is there's this need and sense of um, wanting to find some sort of community. Um, there's a lot of social fragmentation, a huge sense of consumerism, and people are wanting to find a place where they can lead a more environmentally conscious lifestyle while also building that sense of community. Um, there are also a lot of trends. If you read literature that kind of connect the eco-village movement with countercultural movements of the 60s and the 70s. Um, and I really liked this very powerful quote um, from, you know, this author, Leila Dreger, and researcher, where she really talks about how diverse eco-villages are, but there's this core sense of wanting to, you know, deal with issues head on and live an environmentally sustainable lifestyle. So why are eco-villages important? So this photo is actually a gentleman that I had the opportunity to interview while I was in Uttarakhand. Um, and I would say that there are many different reasons and this will vary based on who you speak to. Um, but I do think that this type of model of scaled up could have the potential to really be a sustainable solution. Um, and the eco-village movement also, um, based on this one researcher, has the potential to um, transform over 7 million different villages in um, India. So these are just examples of different sustainable work being done in eco-villages. And these are all photos I took myself um, while doing my field research. Um, so you can see that there's like this woman, um, her name was Bimla Auntie. Um, I would call everyone Auntie because I'm Indian of origin. So I had to show that sign of respect. And she would use this solar panel. It was kind of like a poly house to dry up spices and everything was solar paneled. And then on the right, you can see women um, doing rice planting and utilizing in this farm organic practices. So these photos were taken from the two eco villages that I ended up studying. But there are many different techniques that are utilized that are not captured, like rainwater harvesting or um, organic composting and even treatment of sewage water. The water that's being used in the rice planting is treated water. Um, and so the approach I ended up utilizing was a case study approach. So I looked at two different eco-villages um, with two different types of models. One was an intentional um, eco-village, the Alvag, and then the other was a collection of five neighboring villages that were traditional villages that were working with nonprofit organizations um, to become more environmentally sustainable. So um, as Allison mentioned, I did over 150 one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, I had approximately 15 open-ended questions, um, and I had um, even two focus group um, conversations with youth. And something that was really critical was I was going into these communities, the village on the right, this is a photo of a women's meeting I, I attended on one of the first few days um, I was in this community. Um, but it was really important for me to build that trust and do it effectively, but also quickly since I was on a field visit and wasn't there for a very long time. I, was, I lived there for over a month with a family. Um, the women I was working with saw me every day. So 
they saw I was trying my hardest to integrate myself. And um, something I also did was I worked with local residents and students. So in the Alvog, I worked with a young woman, a young professional who really knew the community members and was able to come with me on my field visits and interviews. Um, and then in the rural villages in Uttarakhand, I worked with two students from a local university, one who is a native. And then I also partnered with a woman from each village and they would come with me and help introduce me to their friends. Um, and that was a great way to establish trust quickly. Um, so just quickly on the Alvag Agra, um, the Alvag translates to Garden of the Merciful in Hindi. Um, it's an ashram community. They about to over 2,500 permanent residents. Um, everyone who lives there chooses to live there and live this environmentally conscious lifestyle. Um, they produce everything. Um, usually that the inhabitants need at a no cost, no um, loss basis. And what this really does is creates the sense of belonging and community. Everyone is able to get all the resources they need to live a comfortable lifestyle. And so they feel this sense of obligation to ensure that the community continues um, to be successful. Um, and this is a photo I took right outside of the main um, satsang ashram hall. Um, so these are just some of the sustainable practices. I won't go through all of them for the sake of time, um, but I'm happy to share this with folks if they're interested. Um, but there is a huge emphasis on utilizing different environmental practices to really ensure that you know the community is sustainable and people who live there are conscientious and know that they're deciding to live this type of lifestyle. Um, so I did primary data analysis. These are some of the questions I asked. I did it as an open-ended survey because given the time frame and also wanting to get the most out of the conversations, I felt that if I had a more quantitative study, which was the initial approach I was thinking of, I wouldn't be able to get as much answers. And also, um, you know, people were very skeptical to share this information with me. So having it be more conversational allowed me to get more um, data in the end. So I really wanted to understand like, what was their lifestyle like? How did they feel like people who are not from the community might feel if they came into the village, um, the eco village? Um, and those were different questions I tried to capture. And then just some key findings is that people feel like the community is very carefree. It's very clean. That's a picture of me actually doing some of the agricultural work. Um, there's this, um, the community's religious belief of simple living is what really encourages folks to live this lifestyle. There's no extreme poverty in the community. The challenges are that it's in the middle of a very bustling city. And a lot of the resources you normally would have access to in a city like running hot water or air conditioning is not, not something that's always easily accessible. That's of course by choice, but if you're not from the community, you might find that to be a big bit of a transition. Um, and then this is these are this is a summary of the two nonprofits that I um, partnered with when going into Uttarakhand, my second case study. Um, these were traditional villages, so they weren't built with the concept of being an eco village, but through their work with two nonprofits, um, they really worked with them over a period of 15 years to establish different practices like organic farming or in-house composting. And um, that this was a very different case study because again, um, these were not, they. a lot of the people said they lived environmentally conscious lifestyles from the beginning just because of their way of life, but they weren't necessarily doing it consciously always. So I interviewed over 100 individuals um, in these five different villages. I did um, two focus groups, and then these were some of the questions I asked. And I really wanted to understand like what they thought about this program, since this was something that two you know nonprofits from Delhi were implementing, and really see how they felt about it. Um, so key findings: um, community members have some understanding of climate change; they see it in their everyday life, but. They're more interested in working with these nonprofits because of the economic benefits versus necessarily the environmental ones. Um, agriculture has dramatically decreased and a lot of the young people are leaving the community because they don't feel like they have job opportunities. There was a huge monkey problem. There were so many monkeys that would destroy the crops and in almost every interview that was brought up. Um, and a lot of the women I spoke with did indicate that they did have a sense of, they did see a difference because of the work they did with the organizations. They felt more empowered to speak up in the community and to talk about these issues and, and to be at the forefront. 
So uh, my conclusion is that I do think the eco village movement is very effective on a micro level, but we need to um, get, have more research to really understand why it is an effective model. This is just two case studies. There are many other um, communities that exist. So I do think that's important. Um, we need to get more buy-in from you know, stakeholders and officials um, and also create incentives for younger folks to want to do this work. I think I'm running over, so I'm going to, that's it. Um, thank you. Um, happy to talk more about this in the Q&A, or if you have specific questions, please feel free to reach out. And uh, perfect. Just a few seconds. Wonderful. And you can also see um, Artie's uh, LinkedIn address there. So wonderful. And now we are going to hear from, uh, and please also correct me, this is a great opportunity for everyone to learn, um, if I don't pronounce your name correctly, Changdai Glassy Tranuyen. You are fine. That's totally correct. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're very kind. We look forward to hearing your presentation. So I should just go ahead. Yes, please, Changdai. Oh, wait, I'm so sorry. Silly me. I was so thrilled that you said my pronunciation was okay that I totally forgot to introduce you. Thank you. <laughs> Unearthing borderland motherland stateless bodies in transnational limbo is the topic that Changdai is going to be talking with us about today. And Changdai is completing her dissertation at the Department of Anthropology at UC Riverside. She is studying the recent immigration and deportation policies in the United States. She's an award-winning bilingual author and she's the sole scholar to have conducted hundreds of oral history interviews and multi-sided ethnographies on the Vietnamese diaspora in the United States, Europe, Australia, and Asia for over 26 years. She has a master's in history from CSU Fullerton, a master's in anthropology from Stanford, a master's in Southeast Asian studies from UC Riverside, and she's published over 3,000 poetic, creative translation and critical works in academic journals. Um, she's received a number of fellowships and she's written to a number of audiences ranging from our youngest, um, as young as kindergartners to, um, to uh, fellow uh, experts in the field. Without further ado, Chong Dai, we really look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much, Alison, for um, all of the work that you and um, the other organizers have done on this wonderful conference. Um, it really, this is my first virtual conference, my first virtual presentation, and uh, it's also my first public engagement uh, since you know the lockdown in March. So um, it's really um, very exciting and very reviving for me. It also reminded me uh, a lot of my Fulbright experiences and. Um, also, the presentation is truly a product of um, the research that I did during my Fulbright year in Sweden. So um, here it goes. Oh, how do I go? Um, the last few decades have seen human flows further complicate water discourses and regulations. In this presentation, I argue for the concept of borderland, motherland as the betweenscapes that triangulate human experiences between the physical borders, the sending nation, and the receiving countries. Borderland motherland invokes both the geographical restrictions of nation states and their control, as well as disrupts the connotations of motherlands as an assumed stable notion. In the context of undocumented Vietnamese diasporas, I look at how legitimacy and legality glide together in a circuitous dance that debunk notions of consanguine rights land heritage, and legal belonging. Through multi-sided fieldwork, oral histories, and visual cultural production, I show how the performative memory work of migration sustains a borderland motherland that defies and glides across geopolitical jurisdictions. Why should we be concerned about stateless bodies? Well, statelessness is a pressing issue of our time and even more so in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
According to the UNHCR, the exact number of stateless people is undocumented, but there are around many millions around the world, and one third of whom are minors. Uh, statelessness is an ongoing, ongoing global pandemic that further marginalizes the most vulnerable among us. The borderland motherland concept is relevant to the contemporary context of the US in lieu of the anti-immigrant rhetoric and increasingly restrictive immigration policies and control from the lo local to the federal levels. At the global level, I argue that BIPOC communities have occupied this space as a means of survival and resistance since colonial times in their own home and land. In his reflections on the origins and spread of nationalism, the late scholar Benedict Anderson shows that the immediate genealogy of nationalisms should be traced to the imaginings of the colonial state. The rise of nationalism in the Southeast Asian colonies was responsible for the formation of the independent nation states and their political orientation. The mapping of both the human population through the census and the mapping of the land served the purpose of colonial control and exploitation. I will highlight three contexts of Vietnamese unauthorized migration through the boat people in the Pacific Ocean starting mid 1970s, the migrants through the Ukraine forest since the early 1990s, and immigrants in Berlin since 1989. I would like to note that throughout this paper, as well as in my research in the last two and a half decades, I privileged the voices and perspectives of ethnic Vietnamese immigrants, refugees, and artists, and treat them both as data and theories. This has been my strategy and effort to decolonize research and academia. Data and ethnographic fieldwork were collected in Vietnamese. All English translations are mine. My deepest thanks go to the Vietnamese undocumented immigrants who made time to share their experiences with me. The data presented here were collected during my Fulbright year in Sweden in 2004 and 5. And in March 2005, I was invited to present my research at the German Fulbright seminar. I procured permission from the Swedish Fulbright Commission to stay after the seminar to conduct interviews and short term fieldwork in Berlin. In summer 2005, after my Fulbright Fellowship had concluded, I remained in Europe and used my own funding to conduct additional research in Poland and other places. Intimating the waves with Zhou Zheng Sen, my whole family escaped illegally. We paid five teals of gold per person. We did not have enough money to pay the fee, so my grandmother asked my uncle to loan us 13 units of gold, which we paid back with interest in 1300 US dollars. Our boat was registered for 200 people. We escaped at night from the Itha. I don't know what happened, but there were 600 people on board. The boat was only 24 feet. We were actually pushing elbows. There were, there were supposed to be food and water on board, but if you sat in the middle, you couldn't reach out and get anything. Every day, they would give you a dizzy liter of water. My youngest brother was too young, so my family saved all of our water for him. I did not have water to drink. My oldest brother collected seawater, which we squeezed lime into to make lemonade. Intimating the woods with Vo Khan, 50 to 100 Vietnamese come to Poland illegally every day. They fly from Vietnam to Moscow and stay in car trains from Moscow to Ukraine. They go through the forest from Ukraine to Poland. Smuggled men face fewer problems than women. They all endure the lack of food and strenuous walking between sites. People walk around 200 kilometers in the forest. Women, especially young, beautiful girls, run the risk of being raped. All of the girls are sexually abused. The second problem is the fee increase en route. If the people were unable to pay extra, the traffickers beat them up and forced the families in Vietnam to send more money. They smuggle, the smuggled people have to pay many prices throughout the journey. Many young girls jump off from the high buildings to commit suicide when forced into sexual activities. The smuggled people are afraid of many things, the police, the smugglers, and the inability to pay the extra fee. Intimating the walls with, with Le Thang Loi. In 1999, we went to Russia and then Germany. 
I have never experienced a moment of peace here in Germany. The court had just processed my refugee application and turned it down again. I reapplied right away. Back then, the police had caught me and wanted to deport me. I got crazy. I just went nuts. Imagine living 80 days in a space that is 40 by 7 meters. My only friend was the watch. My only food was instant noodle, three packs a day. When I ate, it was only to stay alive. I had no feelings, no taste. I had insomnia. I was too shocked by the persecution and fearful for my condition. At night, I was soaked in sweat. I was scared and I was screaming loudly. The memory work of Vietnamese diasporic migration experiences shows the radical intimacy that the immigrants share with the high sea, the deep forest, and the metropolis. I argue that visual productions reflect the memory affectivities in the human and non-human relationality in migration. In many ways, the buried memories of undocumented mobilities are like abandoned infrastructures. They are there, painfully present, yet utterly hidden. In the ethnographic movements above, undocumented Vietnamese immigrants recall how their experiences involve several complex networks of actors beyond the human bodies, which continue to influence the immigrants long after the actual encounter, more so if such encounters unfold in risky moments. I argue that the borderland motherland is forged across space and time, both within and without legal spheres. In effect, I show that Vietnam itself is a refugee, shifting from the fixed notion of a nation state and land mass to more fluid experiential expressions and realities. I gesture beyond the Vietnamese diaspora context toward the recent refugee crisis in the Middle East or the ongoing struggles of immigrants at the US-Mexico border which very much embody a borderland, motherland spirit. By way of conclusion, I'd like to ponder the question, how does the earth map out human bodies? And how is the earth mapped out by human bodies? The world map would look very different if it were based on human movements that lead into each other. These movements would highlight a much more complex experiential world in which a conscious historicization of the human experiences exposes how imperialism and colonization have dispossessed indigenous local populations in its throes of invading virgin land. Borderland motherland is an interstitial space over which exclusion and precarity hover, but in which hope is nursing cross-ethnic solidarity and possibilities. The colonization of land, people, and culture has robbed non-white people of the right to be, cornered them into futile lands, submerged them into nameless slavery through further labor exploitation, disrupted their biological makeup through toxic food and environmental destruction, and created dependency in all aspects. But they keep rising. Hope is their soil. Solidarity is their blood. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, Trang Dai, thank you so much for that deeply moving presentation. Uh, we have with us today, and Chelsea, please tell me if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Is it Chelsea Robbenheimer? Yep, Robbenheimer, that's correct. Robbenheimer, okay, thank you. So Chelsea is going to be talking about Data for Social Change, Mapping the Results of 2020's Racial Justice Activism. And um, Chelsea is a monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning specialist for an international consulting firm. Um, and that firm specializes in using data and evidence to improve global, global sustainability practice. She was a 2016 Fulbright English Teaching Fellow and a 2017 Fulbright mentor and regional coordinator based in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil for both years. And um, she taught English there and social justice courses at the university there and developed a civic education program um, for elementary age students as well, as well as a film club to highlight uh, themes of racial justice for children. She has a master's in international education policy from Harvard. 
and a bachelor's in Spanish literature from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And um, her passion and her goal is to continue the critical work of building an anti-racist culture. Um, Chelsea, uh, please take it away. Okay, all right, okay. thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Hi everybody, I'm super uh, happy to be here with you all today. Um, uh, Fulbright was such a special part of my life and it's really great to be together again with this, with this community. Um, so let me go ahead and share. Um, if I can figure out how to do that here. Um, let's see here, apologies. Oh, here we go, of course. Okay, so um, I am a researcher at the Institute for Development Impact. Uh, we focus on using data and evidence to uh, improve social policy, particularly policy that is focused on global sustainability, as Allison mentioned. Um, during the time of, of all this kind of uh, protest and activist, activism that happened around the United States, and around the world, um, particularly in the summer months in, in kind of the Northern hemisphere, uh, June, July and August, and really continuing on to today. Um, my institution had this uh, thought of what can we do as an institute to kind of further the movement and to use our skills and strengths um, as a way to highlight what's been happening in this country. And so given that we're a group of researchers and we also have a technology arm that's focused on data visualization, we decided that we would build a historical archive uh, to document the tangible results um, of the global protests and the racial justice activism in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Um, and we use the word tangible specifically because we knew that it, we're unable to capture really the the changed hearts and minds and, and, and racial awareness that um, have really come as a result of, of um, you know, this collective action, but we could capture what institutions have done in response to the calls, calls for pro of, of protesters. Um, so in that sense, we've, we've watched this, this uh, very ambitious project um, and I am joined by a fantastic research team. Um, they're not here with me today to present, but I really would be amiss if I didn't recognize them for all the work that they've been doing and have done uh, as part of this project. So Athena, Jackson, Li Ping, Rikia, and, and Ali have been really essential in, in um, helping uh, myself and the Institute to create this, this project. So uh, I know that this is an international crowd, so I just wanna, wanna kind of contextualize the work that we're doing right now. So on May 25th, 2020, uh, George Floyd, an African American man was murdered by the police uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, he is joined uh, by a long list of African American men and women that have been victims to police violence here in the United States um, from the beginning of, of our history. Um, his death really um, incited this, this movement uh, that peaked in kind of mid-June of this year. Um, protests all across the country, all across the world, um, and people were saying this is, you know, the biggest racial justice movement and moment we've had since the civil rights movement in the, in the 1960s. Um, and so because of these calls from, from protesters, from activists, a lot of institutions came out and said that they were going to take action um, to answer these calls in, in recognition of what was, what was going on. So we wanted to, to kind of capture all of that really. Um, so in a sense, what we decided was that the, our goal of this, this database or this archive was first to, to create this resource for activists to cite objective evidence of change. Um, a lot of people asked, you know, what, what has this done? What has this produced? You know, has, has anything really changed? And we wanted to say, well, well yes, and, and here's examples of, of everything that institutions have done. 
Um, we also wanted to build incentives and social pressure for other actors um, by highlighting actions of the peer institutions. And so um, if you, you know, were a representative of a company and you were able to use this database to see what other you know, competitors perhaps had done, perhaps this would be kind of a sort of social pressure for them to also take more action. And then also just to create this body of public evidence. Um, this is going to be a, a public database um, and it, it will be searchable by journalists, researchers, people that want to use this just to get a sense of, of really what happened in this very historical moment in, in our history. So we started our research with looking at four different sectors, private sector, um, so any range of, of company, public sector at the local, state and national level, uh, civil society, so that's you know from um, uh, religious institutions to, to charities and academia. So looking at you know, um, schools, K through 12, but also higher education. Um, we thought for the purpose of the database, it would be much more interesting if it was um, searchable on a more granular level. And so we broke this down into 18 different institution types and each result uh, that we are adding into the database is tagged under each one of these institution types. Um, we also came up with a categorization system for the types of action. So we have 10 different types of action that we um, Basically, these were the patterns that we were seeing in the data that we were collecting. So uh, organizations that were expressing solidarity, obviously police reform was a, was a big part of it, um, honoring black history and culture, uh, institutions that actually you know, renamed buildings or spaces after um, African-American uh, leaders. Um, so we also, beyond those kind of key two different tags, um, oops, sorry. Uh, we also came up with these different lists. So uh, this is kind of these different lists that we're curating to give people different opportunities to kind of slice and dice the data and, and analyze it in different ways. So if they want to look at Democrat-led institutions, if they want to look at Republican-led institutions, if they want to drill down to police reform results that actually defunded the police, um, which was a big uh, call of, of protesters and, and activists, they, they could do that as well. So where are we now? We have, uh, the Institute for Development Impact has the, as a technology team, we've been able to kind of build a custom database for these results. Um, and I want to go into that now. Um, can you all see this? Allison, if you could just nod, if you could say, okay, great, perfect. Okay, so this is the back end of the, of the database here. Um, so this is gonna be searchable. Again, this will be launched in about, a month. Um, so if we wanted to look at a specific, you know, institution, we can search by institution name, uh, we can search by city, and we can see everything that um, different institutions in, you know, Austin, Texas have done. Um, everything has a date associated with it, um, an action type, institution type, as mentioned, a location, and their particular tags that they fall into one of these lists that we're, we're curating. Um, I think an interesting part of, of what we were able to find thus far in, in, in this database is really the stories that this data can tell us, um, which result from, from sustained collective action. So I just want to particularly uh, call out Yum Brands, which is kind of the parent company of Taco Bell and KFC. So you know, at the beginning of these protests that kind of started off in, in May, um, or sorry, in, in very late May, they came out and they issued a call for, for unity. Um, you know, as protests continued, as people went out into the streets, they pledged $3 million. But it didn't stop there. People kept going out to the streets. People kept using their voices. People kept calling for change. And then they, had, in late June, they went to uh, invest $100 million uh, to fight inequality. And so in this sense, you know, over a month's time, they went from just issuing a call to unity to then investing $100 million. And there's so many stories like this that you can find within this data um, that show you really what this kind of sustained pressure can do. Um, and if you click on each one of these, it, it, it gives more of a descriptive information about what actually happened. Um, so we're also working on, on developing visualizations that kind of help people better interact with the data, better understand what they're kind of looking at here. Again, we, this is very much an in-process um, uh, research 
projects. So we have the, you know, the core team of, of researchers. We also have data contributors. Um, and I, I really think we could capture thousands of actions here because so much has been done. Um, we also have kind of a timeline where we can map this along the um, daily protests and see where there's spikes in actions and whatnot. Um, and then the last thing I want to show you guys is kind of this map that we're developing. And so eventually we'll be able to kind of drill down to different institution types if you just wanted to see you know what different state governments have done of course we've got lots of states to fill in here um, or if you kind of wanted to drill down by action type and see where different racist symbols have been removed and that's for example like nascar banned the um confederate flag specific cities uh like richmond removed statues of confederate leaders and whatnot you'll be able to do that with this um, so really what's next we're planning to launch this in late november 2020 uh, so in a few weeks from now we're hoping to get um, several hundred more data points in the database before we're launched just so people have a little bit more to to kind of interact with there um, and we absolutely would love for more people to get involved um, to help with data contribution and to kind of help make this a more of a robust database. Um, so I'd love to answer any questions and um, please feel free to, to contact me even after this um, presentation as well. Thank you. Chelsea, thank you so much. Um, this is really as the panel goes on, right? We have so many touch points. I'm, I'm sure we're gonna have a fascinating conversation to cross connect. And we have one more panelist, um, Anne, please do tell me if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Anne Schiller. Um, thank, you. Th thank you. And uh, you'll be talking uh, to us, thank you very much, about cross-cultural social networks and community building in, is it Lecce Puglia? That's perfect. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, Anne is a professor of anthropology at George Mason University. Her scholarly interests include identity, cultural heritage, and tourism. And she earned her BA in anthropology at the University of Virginia and her master's and PhD in anthropology at Cornell University. Um, She's had fellowships and grants to support her field work uh, from Fulbright and as well as a number of other organizations, including the National Geographic Society. And her most recent book, um, Comercianti a Firenze, Firenze, Identita e Cambiamento nel Quartiere di San Lorenzo. Sorry, I think I had a little uh, uh, like, gringo Portuguese accent in that Italian. <laughs> um, uh, draws upon her field research uh, in Florence's historic center. Um, so we really look forward to your telling us about informal social organizations and the multicultural community of Lecce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. It's, I have so much respect for Fulbright and so much gratitude for the opportunities that Fulbright has given me throughout my career. Can you see my screen? I see you um, okay. and uh, in terms of right. the uh, I might have to ask you to put it put it there because uh, from um, what I see I can it's not going to allow me to do anything else. And okay. I will share it. Hold on. Thank Perfect. you, Shaz. Thank you, Shaz. Oops, too many things going on here. Here we go. Great. Let's go to the to the start the slideshow so we can go to slide one. So Shaz, can you put it just on the title slide here? Uh, sure. Back one. Oh, sorry about this. I'm trying to. Um. 
Perfect. Thank you. Are we good? Yes. So many of us are interested in why people relocate to other countries. And yet the topic of expatriation is understudied. Expatriates in Italy often tell me that they relocated to enjoy the life ways associated with that country, including being part of local communities. And today I'm going to present some early results of research on expatriate social networks in Southern Italy. I began the project with a 2016 Fulbright Award to Puglia and I have since been back five times. Next slide, please. Italy has experienced population decline, but the number of resident foreigners is growing. And today I'm speaking only about a very particular subset. Official statistics are not easily accessed, but the number of Americans, British, Australians, Canadians, and Northern Europeans living in Italy has reached hundreds of thousands. Next slide. Next slide, please. you have to go back to slide three. Perfect. So let's consider the word expatriate, sometimes called vanguards of the global citizenry, expatriates resist simple characterizations. In an article on American expatriation, Nancy Green noted that the term was first used in a 1902 novel that presented a very unflattering picture of life among foreigners, a quote, where do you live now, a female character asks another American. In Paris, he replies. Expatriates, she says scornfully. Why did this man live away from that dear country and tacitly repudiate the flag? So note to Fulbright reviewers, that woman is not a good candidate for a Fulbright award. But the term expat often conjures images of corporate employees on temporary assignments and many people reject that, that word and, proceed, and pre prefer to be called international residents of Italy. Nomenclature aside, it's evidence that these individuals are migrants and they should not all be considered privileged. Some of them are retirees trying to make ends meet. Some are plumbers, some are yogurt teachers, some are cooks. Next slide, please. My interlocutors live in Lecce province on a peninsula between the Adriatic and the Ionian Seas. Next slide, please. The provincial capital, a city of 97,000, is also called Lecce, and it enjoys important distinctions. It's known as the Florence of the South, the capital of the Baroque for its remarkable art and architecture. It's also the so-called capital of a culturally distinct zone known as Gran Salento, and that's associated with a spider bite dance, a particular cuisine and stupendous natural beauty. Next slide. When I went to Lecce, I began learning about informal social organizations, ISOs for short, that involve expats. An ISO is a voluntary association like a book club. There are many kinds of multicultural ISOs in Lecce and to understand their role in network building and migration experiences, I collect data using anthropological techniques of participant observation. Scholarly studies on international ISOs are few, but many focus on ISOs in the US and some researchers approach them as sites for producing social capital. In bowling alone, Putnam writes that quote, social capital refers to connections among individuals and the social networks and norms of reciprocity and trustworthiness that arise from them. He argues that social connectedness is cultivated by creating conditions for friendship. ISOs yield capital that the members mobilize in their everyday life. And this also speaks to Granovetter's interest in the strength of weak ties. He emphasized the transformative power of interpersonal connections and suggested that micro interactions ultimately have a collective potential to affect societies. Next slide. One ISO is English practice in Lecce, and I consider it an accidental ISO for reasons that I'll explain shortly. Established nine years ago, it meets Tuesdays at 9 p.m. in a cocktail bar called Southward. Five to 20 participants show up on any given Tuesday. There are about 90 participant members. 
There is no agenda. People launch into conversations about topics ranging, ranging from elections to recycling to cheese. And the group is restricted to English speakers at an intermediate to high level. Uh, almost everyone is college educated and no Italian is spoken beyond an occasional clarifying word. Next slide. Now I want to share the results of some interviews and of a 2019 questionnaire. I distributed 50 questionnaires, got 25 responses. Half of the respondents were expatriates and half were Italian. So let's look at a few of the questions. You see length of participation. You see, does participation help you better understand foreign cultures? Have you made foreign friends through your participation? Uh, and you'll notice that out of 25 respondents, 12 participants had been there fewer than three years, but half of that number had been there for more than one year. And that suggests that the group is robust and will continue. So why do non-Italians remain part of the group for so long? Well, some mentioned giving back to Italy and non-mother tongue, non-Italian English speakers mentioned keeping up their English. But every non-Italian talked about making new friends, social networking, developing cultural understanding, or wanting to be in a community. Why do Italians attend? Native Italian speakers mentioned improving their English, but also the importance of meeting people from the backgrounds, knowing different kinds of people. And as one told me through the group, we improve their cross nations. Next slide. The questionnaire also revealed that many of these individuals are not just seeing one another on Tuesday nights. Uh, people are clearly one, inviting one another out socially, most often for food, unsurprisingly, but to participate in other activities as well, as well cultural activities, visits to other, other regions. Um, and that participants seek one another's company in other contexts is unsurprising. If you look at the response to the question of whether the group is important to anyone's personal happiness, it is. So let me share three interview quotes that underscore that point. The first two are from Italians. My week isn't good if I don't come here and talk to my good friends, one said. Another, I feel more at home and have more in common with the people in this room, wherever they are from, than many people I've known my whole life. And a non-Italian remark, it is nice to feel valued by Italians. Next slide. A scholar in community planning has written that in some types of communities, heterogeneous actors become connected through mutuality and reciprocity, even in situations where prevailing social norms, and here I would say cultural norms, uh, are less strict. And she wrote, putting people in contact with one another is a first step towards collaboration. Contacts are not in themselves sufficient. It is the soft infrastructure of shared knowledge, understanding, norms, rules, and expectations that groups of individuals bring to recurrent activities. And then there can be feedback loops whereby strong network connections support a common identity and the common identity supports community bonding. For that reason, I consider English practice in Lecce to be an accidental ISO. If you read this quote from the founder, uh, you'll understand that its original goal was very straightforward, hold interesting conversations in high level English. Its longevity, however, is due to the social capital it created in the back room of a cocktail bar in one particular Southern Italian city. As my research continues, I hope it brings new insights to understanding community building abroad, uh, a process which with, many, with which many Fulbrighters are also personally familiar. Uh, and if you could hit the next slide, thank you to Fulbright and others. And the final slide, contacts and some interesting sources. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne. And uh, as you can see, the panelists have all shared contact information and uh, bridging connections is what the Fulbright Association is all about. I am just going to check and see um, about questions and answers that, uh, that we might have. 
Oh, wow. Um, okay, the first question, we'll start with our uh, uh, last speaker. And by the way, I just want to thank all of you. I mean, you're all doing such rich and deep work that really involve listening to voices that are often not traditionally heard and making sure they're part of the weave of our understanding who we are as Americans here and abroad and how we are part of global citizenry. So thank you, thank you for your work. Um, we have a question uh, for Anne. Um, is there a way that Fulbright or the State Department can promote more ISOs of expatriates? Um, it does seem like a good way to build meaningful relationships. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I think about my Fulbright experience here at the University of Salento, uh, it would have been, had I had the contacts that I do now, it would have been a, a wonderful opportunity to build something like that with the community. And uh, I want to think about that great idea a bit more because it's not too late. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, absolutely a Fulbrighter particularly those of us who are fortunate enough to have institutional hosts can, can reach into the community quite quickly. I noticed in some of the, the co-panelist presentations, they talked about how they relied on local networks to accomplish their research. It would be a wonderful goal for a Fulbrighter to, to help establish these ISOs as well. So thank you for that. Great idea. Thank you. Um, and I, I uh, Arti, uh, the next question is for you. What were some of the personal challenges that you faced in conducting your research? Um, did you have the language skills to, to do your interviews and have you maintained those friendships? Um, that's a really good question. I would say one of the challenges was just being a woman in the field. Um, all the time people were like, why are you here? Does your, is your family not worried about you traveling and doing this research? Um, and because I was staying with a family, like there was a lot of curiosity around that. And I do think I had to be like conscious of being a woman in the field. Being a woman in the field. I'm sorry, there's some feedback. I don't know if others are hearing that. Okay, I'll just continue. Um, but what I was saying is that I definitely was, that was definitely something I was conscientious of. And then um, I had some language skills, although initially it was challenging just because it was also having that comfort, sense of comfort while doing those interviews. So what was really helpful is I did work with students who um, spoke English fluently and could kind of help as I was getting more comfortable with the content. And also there was a dialect in the rural area I was in. So it was, I would always suggest even if you are very fluent, it's always great to have someone who knows the area who can come with you also for like directional purposes. Um, and also it helps build trust. And it's really, I wish I could keep in touch with the women. What's really hard is very few of them have like any social media at all, like at the very most, they have like a little Nokia phone. So it's not easy to keep in touch. But what was really um, cool was one of the students I worked with ended up asking me for a recommendation. I was able to help provide that to him. And that was a good feeling because I felt like they had really helped me out a lot. Like it wasn't possible for me to do that work without their support. So on and off, keep in touch, but definitely um, was very much still in touch with the other Fulbrighters who were there in India during the same time. I went to my um, roommate's wedding in Oklahoma. So I really do believe those friendships, you know, stick with you and um, having that support system as a Fulbrighter with other folks in the Fulbright community um, was really helpful. And um, we were able to share ideas. So I definitely keep in touch with them. But a lot of the people I did field research with um, actually in the field, it's been hard. Thank you for your frank response. Um, next question is for Chelsea. Uh, how do you plan to sustain and maintain your database? Uh, keeping such databases fresh and updated can be a challenge. Yes, great question. Um, so first thing I should say is that we decided to include in this database um, actions from institutions that have happened from 
from May 25th onward. Um, so we recognize that there's been a lot of institutions that have made changes already, um, especially since the Black Lives Matter movement has, has really gained traction over the years. But we really wanted to look at this kind of discrete moment in history and, and, and capture really what institutions had done kind of as a result of, of these protests over the summer. So in that sense, the data, the new data that's coming out will eventually end. Um, so we had a, a question today, actually, we we're just talking about this with the research team is, you know, what's the last date that we're going to look for for new data points? Like, is it six months after the peak of the protest? Is it a year after? And we thought we were going to come to a, a specific answer today, but we actually decided that we weren't because we still that we were not going to because we're still kind of in the movement and there's there's really still you know still protests happening um, and there's still institutions that are that are taking action so. Um, we're not putting kind of an end date on what this this database is going to capture yet, but I believe we're going to so in that sense we. We kind of have this team that's that's trying to capture what has happened recently and what is happening now, but kind of in the long term, I don't think there will be a lot of maintaining that will have to be done in kind of the years to come. Um, and one thing I, I also wanted to say is that particular actions like, for example, bills or acts that were introduced in, in state governments or federal governments, um, we, we thought that it would be pretty difficult to kind of keep track of the, how they've progressed in Congress, whether they've passed, whether they were rejected. And so each data point has its own source document. And so if there's a, a result that's, for example, you know, Congress introduced the Eric Gardner Chokehold Act, for example, the, the person that's looking through the database can then um, use that link and then actually track the bill and see if it's passed or not. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Chong Dai, uh, this next question is for you. Um, has your research inspired uh, any activism by you students, given that immigration is such a challenging political issue? Uh, thank you for that question, and thank you again, Alison, for um, moderating our uh, poster fair. Um, well, um, I did hear um, there was a, a workshop, um, a writer's workshop uh, at USC, and uh, Joyce James called me a walking NGO because um, I started out um, in the uh, 1990s using my own student loans um, to conduct my first research projects because I felt very keenly the needs to share the Vietnamese American experiences with the larger scholarship. Um, there were not too many um, re uh, research projects done back then on the community um, because of the cultural barriers, also because of the language barriers. Um, and, you know, it's a new community also. So um, I started out um, with using my own student loans because I, you know, I was new in the U.S. I was a refugee and um, I didn't know about grants. I didn't know about food, right? Um, so I was um, conducting research here in Little Saigon, Orange County, California. And I kept building on that. Um, and um, my work has um, always centered the community and the local and the, the narrators, um, you know, uh, in in the methodology as well as well as in uh, the content. So um, that has helped a lot of people connect with um, the work, but also bringing together through this work, I was able to bring together um, the community and academia because I think there's usually a gap between you know uh, the research we do and then the people we study, um, and uh, I'm so glad to see new generation, new um, scholars um, going into this topic and trying to understand um, where the community came from, um, the traumatic experiences that they um, experienced, and also how these uh, experiences impact them today. Um, so currently my project on my discipline is on deportation in um, the US of Asian refugees. 
and that is um, I was able to help bring my expertise from South Asian studies um, to give the language to advocate uh, to you know the people working on the ground, um, people who are dealing directly with these issues, also impacted people to use the cultural currency um, to know the language in order to address the issues that they are facing. For instance, to talk about the myth, the origin um, that the Vietnamese people hold dear to heart, you know, that we descended from the dragon uh, king and the fairy queen and how there was separation actually, forced migration from the beginning in that story as well, um, that 50 children went with the father to the sea and 50 children went with the mother to the mountain. Um, but how does all of that, you know, that cultural consciousness feed into our current situation where families are being separated um, and because of deportation? So I hope I answered your question and thanks for asking. That was absolutely fascinating. That lent a whole new dimension to this idea of somehow putting the extraordinarily painful separation of families into a almost legendary framework. I I had never imagined that before as a kind of narrative redemptiveness. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I I have one question for each of the panelists. And Carla, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. And then um, sadly, we'll have to say, uh, let's not say adieu uh, or goodbye, but we'll just say uh, a bientot uh, until very soon because we're all gonna connect together and stay connected. Um, but you know, the extraordinary Fulbright experience is are those moments of vulnerability where you had an idea to go and do your research, your teaching, and uh, you thought you had a plan, or I uh, had expectations, uh, and then uh, it happens. Something that makes you feel vulnerable, perhaps a bit caught off guard, and it's a moment of um, perhaps humbling insight, self awareness. Anything <laughs> like that happened. Uh, that you'd be willing to share uh, for everyone. Carla, would you like to begin? Um, yeah, sure. It's um, it's been an honor. So I couldn't hear you very well with some noises, but um, so if I understood well. You asked about kind of a remarkable moment in our full ride experience, and I think that. Um, for me, Fulbright itself was a very remarkable experience having one after another uh, because of the changing environment, but also because of the all the opportunities that Fulbright offered. So I think for me, um, very mm, special moment was when Fulbright, uh, the national chapter of DC, connected me to the Spanish embassy there because of an event that they made and that allowed me to get to know their work and be able to collaborate with them later and get more interested in public diplomacy, which is something that I didn't even know what it was when I was in Spain before my Fulbright. And now I'm going to do a PhD on public diplomacy. So that was definitely a very important moment for me and something that I couldn't have done without a full ride. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, this, direct, this question can go in any direction really you wish. Would anyone else like to respond to that question? Uh, sure. I I would like to, I'll let someone, uh, does anyone else want to go? Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I requested, um, I procured permission from the Swiss Fulbright Commission to stay behind after the, the Berlin Fulbright uh, seminar um, to conduct interviews with Vietnamese um, in Berlin. Although my 
project was home in Stockholm and focusing on Vietnamese in Sweden, I did want to have a pan-European perspective. So I trying to, you know, um, get in touch and um, and talk to people in other places um, as much as possible. Uh, and again, go back to my presentation. I did stay during the summer of at the end um, to also interview people in Poland. Um, so I stayed and my Vietnamese host, um, I was able to stay with them. And, um, you know, of course I had no idea what to expect, but um, he took me first, um, they took me, the, the couple took me to a refugee camp in East Berlin. And uh, it, it, it was in a dark area. Um, the building felt almost like it was abandoned. And then we came in and I talked to uh, the family. Um, and this family, um, the, um, the narrator was um, the third contact that I um, that I included in my uh, presentation earlier. Um, he talked about how he was persecuted in Germany and was not able to get, you know, um, uh, asylum status um, through um, the uh, application process. Um, so for me, I became vulnerable because I I felt that I was so privileged as a full writer. Um, I had access to scholarship, to conversations with other scholars, uh, to a whole community of global citizens. Um, and I had the mobility. I had the legal mobility to go from Sweden, from the US to Sweden, to Poland, to um, London, to Berlin. Um, and here is someone who doesn't have the same access to, um, uh, I guess, legal protection and, and legal rights as I do. And so uh, that was one of the moments where, where, during my Fulbright experience, where I um, make a, you know, a deeper commitment to share these stories so that um, we can come to better solutions for people who need um, who need legal status because um, I think NPR just last week or a few days ago um, also um, had a story on how many people in the war zones in the Middle East are still trying to apply and apply over again to get um, to find a place, you know, a safe place to come for their family. So. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to share um, a moment in your Fulbright experience that really was a kind of awakening, an aha moment of connection of some sort? Uh, a moment in your Fulbright experience. Anne, were you going to? Am I on mute? Oh, sorry. Anne, go ahead. I think, you know, I've been very fortunate uh, in my career yeah, because Fulbright has taken me to Borneo, it's taken me to Korea, and Fulbright is And I think that one aha moment for me was when I thought about the role of a Fulbrighter and what did it have in common with the lived experience of, uh, of some of these expats whom I was getting to know. Uh, both the Fulbright life and the expat life are kind of projects of cultural mediation. Uh, Fulbrighters build bridges for research and for passion and, and expats build bridges for practical reasons and, and, and their own reasons. Uh, but at the heart of it is trying to build trust, collaborate and, and create a broader, richer social network that, as my one informant said, makes us all better. And as a Fulbrighter, I was surprised to have so much in common with expats, but it was a nice thing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We are past time uh, because it's the last panel of the day. We've been afforded this luxury of a final question. Um, but if, if uh, perhaps we should uh, say say uh, uh, abiento and um, and thank you all for attending this three day conference. And I really. 
I have to say uh, the Fulbright Association staff, which has been behind the scenes, making sure everything goes so smoothly, has worked so, so very hard. And what I so appreciate about their efforts is that other international organizations, I'm sure you know a few of them, have said, you know what, let's skip this year. Let's just, this is too hard. Or we can't flip this online and kind of capture what makes it special. And the Fulbright Association said, hey, another crazy opportunity to do it. Let's do it. And uh, even if, uh, you know, it means we use, lose a few limbs in the process. And that's just the spirit of this whole organization. Thank you all so much for participating and for being part of it. This is a real triumph of spirit in kind of fraught times. And it really means a lot to have you all here and to be part of this and to know that it exists. We are alive and well, and we are going to move forward. So thank you. <laughs>